I'm very appalled that we've lived through like four years of this Trump administration and Proud Boys and Tiki Torches and Nazis organizing and the legitimacy of fascist militia squads. And you still have well-meaning liberals talking about gun control. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonservium.media. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 23rd episode of the show. I delayed the recording of this intro quite a bit because I was waiting for the results of the U.S. presidential election to finally be announced. Even though this episode was recorded before November 3rd, I was hoping to frame this conversation in the uncanny political context in which we find ourselves. At this moment, due to logistical issues with mail-in ballots, a president has yet to officially be announced. Meanwhile, we see nativists continuing the ripe American tradition of explaining complex phenomenon and simple narratives to fit their worldview in the form of conspiracy theories. I mean, the government is obviously capable of carrying out corrupt acts in secret, but isn't it interesting how people latch onto conspiracy theories that almost always seem to paint them as the victim? Furthermore, when those narratives directly or indirectly encourage threats of civil war, it's difficult to stay silent while others, quote, stand back and stand by. Needless to say, 2020 has been a wild ride, and things do not seem to be cooling down. As most of you know, we don't normally have a heavy emphasis on electoral politics on the show, but this moment feels much bigger than that. And before all the anarchists skip this episode, I want to assure everyone that today's show will not be loaded with presidential political banter. Instead, you're in for a treat because we'll be focusing on a topic that the presidential debates, strangely enough, didn't seem to cover, and that's gun control and firearm freedom. Again, it seems especially relevant given the looming threat of a right-wing coup or of a presidential administration who will be actively hostile to firearm freedoms, despite the negative impact it will inevitably have on marginalized people. But can we say we expected anything less from America's racist uncle who wrote the 90s crime bill? Or from the top cop who's responsible for destroying countless black lives? We also discussed free speech and how social media is reacting to the hostile political climate that we find ourselves in today. With all that said, I think you'll find that my guest's perspective is particularly insightful when it comes to these topics, given her unique situation. So, without further ado, here's my interview with Kelly Wright. Kelly Wright is an activist, public speaker, and writer who focuses on a host of topics ranging from anarchism, queer and trans rights, and privacy. She graduated from Ohio University in 2014 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Economics. She currently lives and works in New York City with her cat Grimes. Kelly, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Of course, how's it going? It's going. It's um, it's Friday. My weekend just started. I'm pretty excited about that. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation we're about to have. Awesome. Hey, well, I know you recently moved from uh, D.C. to uh, New York. Have you had much time to check out the, the anarchist scene there or um, anything like that? Yeah, so I moved to New York City actually about a year ago exactly um, for a new job. And I was very excited to move to the city and I'm still very, very excited to be in New York City. But I have to say I picked a pretty good year um, or maybe a pretty bad year to move to the city because <laughs> maybe six months into my time here, we had the, the lockdowns came down. Mm-hmm. So that said, I haven't really had that much opportunity to really explore and get into the scene here. That said, we did also have 
pretty unprecedented uprisings against police brutality in this country in this past summer. And New York City definitely saw a fair amount of that. And I was very happy to be able to get out into the streets with people and protest pretty frequently, which was really, really encouraging and kind of like, yeah, I don't know, it, it kind of felt it felt almost invigorating. But yeah, I, I think um, it's been a, it's been a weird period of transition with like the pandemic moving from D.C. where I had spent five years and had been very involved in kind of the activist scene there. Um, and I'm kind of, yeah, I'm still getting my, I think I'm still kind of getting my New York City training wheels off as we speak, heading into flu season and maybe a, another wave of this pandemic, which is pretty unfortunate. Right. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you were able to to get out a little bit and hopefully it, it doesn't hit you too hard. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like we are going in that direction. How would you describe yourself politically and how did you come to embrace those opinions? Yeah, so I am constantly changing my opinions. Um, and I think that that's probably a good thing. Um, I was actually nominated and voted um, in high school. My, my senior class in high school actually voted me as most opinionated. <laughs> so that, that's kind of something I've carried with me through undergrad and into my kind of early adult life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, my politics have kind of been all over the place. I would say that I kind of became aware politically in the tail end of high school, kind of heading into college. Um, it's really hard to like retroactively, like, I, I kind of feel like I'm retconning myself when I try to talk about it, but like, I was probably pretty conservative in high school, but really like I was already at that age at like 16 and 17, I was already pretty like comfortable with like LGBTQ community, um, and kind of more socially liberal positions. And I didn't really have the vocabulary to really talk about where I was kind of on the political spectrum. Once I got to college, I got involved in the libertarian groups there, but only after I went to a college Republicans meeting. And this is kind of a funny story where I went to the Ohio University College Republicans, and this had to have been in like maybe 2010. Um, and they were like so disorganized and all they really cared about was getting drunk, which was kind of how like alcohol was kind of what every student group orbited around at OU where they kind of have a, uh, a reputation as being a party school. I was pretty turned off by like that group. I didn't think they were really doing anything. They were just kind of like, yeah, just like Republicans who get drunk together. Um, and so I ended up heading over to the libertarian group, which was students for Liberty and they were much more active on campus with actual like activism, inviting speakers, hosting events, and that sort of thing. And I got very involved there. And I kind of rode that normie libertarian train for a fair amount of time. Um, and that actually saw me kind of, I like graduated college in that space. And my first, my first jobs were very connected in kind of the libertarian and libertarian nonprofit industrial complex, as I like to call it. I kind of like, I don't want to say I'm like ashamed of that period of my time, but I've definitely like grown out of that space mm -hmm. and like very happy. I, I, I hope, I think most people kind of like look back on where they were maybe five or 10 years ago and they kind of cringe and that's mm -hmm. absolutely where I am in, in my life. I very much am cringing at what I was doing in my early and mid twenties. Um, but that's not like the kind of political North star, I guess, through all of this, all even kind of charting the way back to when I was like kind of tea party aligned was really ultimately at the end of the day, was a distrust of authority, particularly in the government and in the state. And I would say that my, the, the evolution of my politics has really been, in my opinion, getting closer to kind of being, being more intellectually consistent in that endeavor. And then that has kind of brought me more with a more sympathetic eye towards what people might consider more leftist criticisms of hierarchy. And yeah, so I guess kind of to put a firmer point on this, I would say is I'm kind of, I'm, I identify as an anarchist. I'm very much in favor of the concept of markets and the important role that they play, the, the role of prices and that sort of thing. So I think I'm pretty comfortably at home in the kind of market anarchist space I think I have, as I'm, you know, I'm constantly reading, I think I'm developing maybe more of a mutualist perspective on certain things. But I say all this as kind of like in my, at least in the last couple of years, I've maybe stopped reading as much theory and I'm focusing kind of more on my career um, and pers personal stuff. 
But that said, like, I mean, I'm not as well read as I was maybe a few years ago, but I think, you know, the the C4SS space, that's where a lot of my writing is being published. They've definitely had a big influence on me. The Their, their book that everyone knows, Markets Not Capitalism, has been really big influence on me the last couple of years. And yeah, a lot, I think a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about, this, a lot of the stuff having to do with me being perma-banned from Facebook, that was actually an endeavor that I undertook with a couple of my peers from C4SS. So it's kind of very much where I am existing currently ideologically. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't realize it was a permanent ban. You're banned permanently from Facebook? Yeah. So to that point, I actually haven't received any communication from Facebook since they disabled my account in, in mid-August. It was like August 19th or August 20th. They Basically, I read some news article about how Facebook had just like mass banned a bunch of QAnon Facebook groups. And they had also mass banned several three percenter groups, um, and like Patriot prayer and these sort of like right wing militia groups. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And I went to open my Facebook app on my phone and it was like, you need to log in. I went to log in and it was like, your account is currently disabled. And I immediately appealed that decision and I got on Twitter and saw that a couple of my other friends had been disabled as well. And I think I'm pretty sure, and you, you would need to, I guess you would need to check for sure with them, but I don't think any of us have received any sort of communication from Facebook about the status of our accounts, why we were banned, why our accounts were disabled. I've submit, I submitted an appeal almost two months ago, exactly. And I've received no communication. So really like I, I wrote a piece for C4SS about why we think we were banned, but we don't really have definitive proof that, you know, the Facebook page we were administering together was the reason. But it seems pretty likely that the, the four of us being banned at the same time as the page being removed as the same time as all the QAnon and 3% or stuff is going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I think I'm permabanned, but I'm, I'm not certain. I think there is probably some opportunity for me to maybe get my personal data. But I'm not. I'm not really like crying over it. To be honest, I needed to get off Facebook anyway. Yeah. What I will say is like, and I, I'd be happy to talk about this in greater length. But I got no warning. Like I didn't get any emails or any kind of notices that I was violating their terms. I didn't get any notices that any of my posts were flagged or anything like that. And the thing that I'm probably most upset about is the fact that like, I, I don't know, I spent like 12 years on Facebook posting kind of my thoughts daily, sharing pictures, selfies, videos, pictures of my cat, stuff that I'm, that I'm kind of sad to not have access to. So that's kind of where my, that's kind of where my mind is right now is trying to get my, my personal information out of Facebook. And then I'll, I'll probably not be back on the platform after this. So you and everyone else who admin the leftists for self-defense and firearm freedom were permanently banned. There's a pretty big gap between right-wing militia types and the group that you were involved with. Why were all of you lumped together and banned at the same time? My very cynical opinion is that Facebook probably coordinated the removal of all these groups and pages in advance. And they probably drafted their press release and they framed their, their like community standards updated page in a way where they could say like, look, we banned all these QAnon conspiracy groups. These, these groups that were really providing nothing of value or just kind of these like cesspools for these weird conspiracy theories. Um, but they could also kind of, they could like sneak in under that kind of press cycle also kind of, you know, banning the anarchists and the, um, the, the leftists along with the same day that I was suspended, my account was suspended. I believe also it's going down, it's going down in crime think, which are two prominent kind of anti-authoritarian news sources. Their pages, their Facebook pages were also disabled along with three percenters. I think a couple, uh, redneck revolt groups were also removed, but I'm not certain on that. But yeah, I don't think there's any connection to the QAnon. I mean, I'm kind of relatively ignorant of the QAnon stuff, but I believe I believe they kind of wanted to hitch like hitch the news cycles almost so that they could they didn't get flack for banning anarchists or, you know, anti-fascists or whoever. The the headlines in the press and the news cycle is all about QAnon and, you know, crazy Pizzagate conspiracy theory groups and that sort of thing. So that's that's my theory. Um, and in the days since they've banned more QAnon groups, and I've also seen recently in the weeks in the weeks and months since I was banned, I saw several environmentalists were also banned. 
So yeah, this is, this is something that's happening. I think something that I'd also be interested in talking about is um, what's in the news more and more frequently, especially this week is this, this uh, section 230, um, which is, I forget the, the piece of legislation it's attached to. It's like the communications and decency act. And it's section 230 of that act. Basically it's in the news a lot because conservatives are mad. They think that social media companies are biased against conservatives and they are trying to basically remove these protections that social media companies and really all media companies have where they're not held responsible for the content placed on their websites. Like, you know, if someone uploads a defamatory video on YouTube, the person who's saying those things can be sued, but YouTube can't be sued. Um, and I think we're going to probably see social media companies like Facebook and Twitter engage in this sort of content moderation and this, and this premature banning when the section 230 stuff is eroded, which I think is probably what's going to happen in the near future, depending on what Congress does. But even, even, um, some of the conservative Supreme court justices have indicated that they want to clarify section 230 and that they think that the courts have given, have interpreted it as giving social media companies or internet companies too much kind of leeway. I don't, I don't know if I'm qualified to speak on that, but that's something that I kind of, I think I, I can kind of see in the, in the way the winds are shifting. I think that this is something that we're kind of heading towards. Right. So why were they threatened by leftists for self-defense? I mean, what what explain to the audience what leftists for self-defense and firearm freedom was and why it might have been a, a threat to Facebook? Yeah. So the leftists for self-defense and firearm freedom was actually a Facebook page. It wasn't even a Facebook group. It wasn't even like one of those groups where people kind of congregate and share posts together. It was a page, meaning it was just kind of like four of us operated it. It was it was myself and three others was created by a friend of mine, Nathan Goodman. I forget when. It's all in that article that we wrote for C4SS. But he created the page. And then I believe a couple years later, I came on. And it's really just like a, it's like a, sh- I, I don't want to like discount it. And maybe Nathan disagrees, but I thought it was at least the way that I used it. It was like a way to like almost kind of shitpost. It was like memes, articles, commentary um, about you know, gun rights, gun legislation, gun control, and articulating it from a perspective of like leftist priorities. And that's to say like, you know, LGBTQ rights, um, the fact that like all contemporary gun control and even historical gun control can be tied to racism and racist motivations. The fact that gun rights were pretty integral to, to the, like the, the working class throughout the country's history. And we didn't advocate anything instructionary. Like our banner image was like the trans pride flag with an AK 47 over it. Our like profile picture was the picture of the black Panthers on the steps of the California state Capitol where they were protesting gun control pushed by Ronald Reagan and the NRA. So yeah, like we just kind of shared, like we shared weird, funny gun rights memes. We shared web comics and YouTube videos and articles about gun control and why we opposed it. And I, I don't know, I get like, it's kind of crazy. Like we, the, it says self-defense in the name. Like it says, it literally says left is for self-defense and firearm freedom. So, and like, I say all this and kind of reiterating my point from a, a few moments ago, I haven't received any, any kind of communication from Facebook. Like I don't, like, I don't know what their problems were with it. Who, kn- who knows what their problems were with it. I know that like the Socialist Rifle Caucus or Socialist Rifle Association is still up. Um, and there's other like the NRA is still up. I don't really know what threat we posed. I think it's probably, it might be a combination of posts from our page, posts individually that we may have made. I don't know what, what Facebook's calculus was for pulling some pages down and leaving some up. But yeah, it's just, I think it is kind of, it is pretty ridiculous that I have lost, you know, all, all of my personal data over this Facebook page that I kind of like, I don't know, I, I maybe posted to that Facebook page, maybe like two or three times a month. Personally, we were probably updating it maybe a couple times a week through the four of us. But yeah, that's, that's my understanding of kind of where things are. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I know, at least. Right, right. It's funny that you bring up that you even put self defense in the name because I mean, you know, they were called the the Black Panther Party for self defense. I wonder if the FBI, <laughs> like, thinks that self defense is like a, a, a an anarchist or a radical dog whistle for insurrection or something. And so, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be surprised. But um, so, in that article that you mentioned earlier, it's called "When Facebook Bans Peaceful Anarchists." but not the violent state, you highlight how there's an explicit policy exception for state violence when it comes to banning accounts on Facebook. 
In other words, if a person or a group promotes or does something that they deem as violent, that's a violation. But if the state does it, Facebook not only allows it, but also boldly states that double standard in their policy. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so I wouldn't, I don't think it's so blatant as kind of the way that maybe you framed it. What I would say is that like I'm kind of, I'm looking at it in my article right now. It says any non-state actor or group that qualifies as a dangerous individual or organization will be banned from the platform. And this is in their update, their dangerous individuals and organizations policy. And so the idea here is that dangerous individuals and organizations include only non-state individuals and organizations. And so my kind of my kind of argument, and I tweeted about this in my tweets embedded in the in the article, um, is that the idea is here is that like they're silencing anti-fascists and anarchists who are ultimately just they just they're not really like the act of being an anarchist or the act of being an anti-fascist is not dangerous or criminal. It's an ideology. It's an idea, right? We're articulating this this idea that the state is a monopoly on violence. The state is itself a dangerous organization, right? So my I just see it as kind of hypocritical, and it's kind of like on a societal level. It's this, it's it's a societal kind of exemption of state violence, where, and I think this is ultimately the crux of what a lot of like anarchists are trying to get, you know, status to at least acknowledge is that the state is itself a monopoly on violence. And we're really just trying to get people to view all acts of violence really neutrally or the same as you would if it was committed by a, an individual or a group of individuals, or if it was committed by someone with a badge or with, you know, some, if it, if it was a, if it was a law, right. Or if it was police brutality, I think maybe people could make this point in a more articulate manner. It just strikes me as really kind of how far into this kind of definition of violence and terrorism that, and, and what, what it means to be a dangerous individual or organization and to exclude the institution that has brought about, you know, Customs and Border Patrol and and family separation policies and dragnet surveillance and drone wars and and all this stuff. So yeah, that's kind of where I that's kind of the angle I was coming from. Um, I don't think it was like Facebook was saying you know the government can do it, uh, but they basically say explicitly in their in their in their policy any non state actor or group that qualifies as a dangerous individual will be banned. And this all goes to show like, I mean Donald Trump's Twitter account violates Twitter's service every day and his his account isn't being banned and like a more recent episode of this was like when trump was diagnosed with COVID 19 a bunch of people were celebrating on twitter and twitter deleted a bunch of people who were celebrating and they were and twitter basically issued a thing saying you can't wish harm or death on someone on our platform and everyone i everyone in my entire network was like cackling because like every trans person deals with death threats or you know harassment um like really any kind of marginalized community on that platform with any sort of publicity is the target of, of that sort of speech. Um, and there's always, they make exceptions for, you know, if the president does it or if the military does it or if the police do it. And that's kind of what I was trying to call attention to in this piece. Right. And do you think that the Facebook crackdown is a part of a larger attempt to silence anarchists and anti-fascists? Or, I mean, you, you kind of hinted at that earlier. Can you sort of expand on, on what that means? I don't think it's like a conspiracy. I don't think it's like, I don't think we're at the point of like, at like Palmer raids, right? Maybe we're kind of approaching that point. I don't think it's like a conspiracy among social media companies to do that. I think it's really the president and the government and conservatives and senators and people in positions of power and authority, people like the FCC, the attorney general, senators, they're very much, I mean, conservatives have been going on and on and on about, you know, like violence in media and, and and all this stuff for decades. But they're they have been kind of beating their chests, and I think I think Facebook in particular, Mark Zuckerberg, they are kind of I think they see that regulation is coming, and I think they are preemptively trying to I don't know, almost like a prophylaxis. They're trying to get in favor, of, so when they're inevitably subpoenaed before Congress or wherever, they can say, "Look, look at all these dangerous anarchists we banned. Look at all these dangerous militia groups we banned." We're clearly taking it seriously. You don't need to regulate us. Or if you do need to regulate us, you need to regulate, like, you need to regulate in this direction that we can, that we can accommodate and that we can survive. 
Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I think in particular, this is escalating now because if I could put on the like, political wonk cap, I think that the social media companies, the, the Congress just released this report about, you know, the potential that they are monopolies and that they should use the trust busting legislation to break up the social media companies. And I think also they're, they're confronting the prospect that, that the Trump administration might be, you know, in its twilight right now on the way out and Democrats might be coming, might be ascending and that the, the kind of regulatory environment they were anticipating for the next four years might not actually be coming. And so they're trying to, they're kind of trying to preemptively position themselves in a way that's better for them in that sense. Right, right. And you mentioned the legislation earlier, but apparently the Trump administration has reportedly begun to make attempts to crack down on QAnon people. I'm not sure if that was the legislation that you were referring to, but do you know much about that and whether or not anarchists should be concerned with it? All I found in terms of the legislation really was some congressional, kind of like meaningless symbolic congressional legislation meant to condemn QAnon. That doesn't really mean anything. It's not like any kind of I don't know, it doesn't pass punishment or anything like that. It's just kind of like, we as Congress condemn, blah, 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 blah. What I was mentioning earlier was the Communications and Decency Act. I believe the Communications Decency Act, I'm probably butchering it. I'm probably completely, um, I'm probably getting that completely wrong. But it's it's that, it's like that 1996 communications law that basically spelled out the very kind of, for lack of a better term, the kind of laissez-faire nature that Congress took to the internet in the 90s, which kind of set the stage for the internet's like explosion and a major credit to that is this section 230 which gives immunity it gives it gives the social media companies it gives google and youtube and facebook and it gives them a sort of leg- like a, a sort of shield that if someone uses their website to to break the law they can't they the company the institution can't be held responsible it's the individual that's held responsible this is the same This was like the same premise behind the controversy around mega upload. I don't know if you know anything about that. Like mega upload was a perfectly like legitimate technology for file sharing. You could upload a file to the cloud, send the link, someone could download it. But it quickly became used for piracy, for pirating like copyrighted material. And their argument, and I'm pretty sure they actually lost their argument, was that mega upload can't be held responsible for um, the actions of their users, how they use the service. There's bipartisan support to go after Section 230, and I think conservatives and pro- conservatives are very excited to go after it because they've been talking about a fairness doctrine since like the 80s or 90s, and Democrats are excited to go after it out of this kind of like trust busting, um, you know, treating corporations in a certain way. Um, and one other thing I wanted to say is I think there's another intersection with this with like the way that Kamala Harris went after Backpage and tried to press charges against them as like as like sex traffickers because they allowed adult classified ads on their website for sex workers. So there's all kinds of like cascading downstream effects of Section 230. And I'm very concerned about the fate of that kind of subsection of that legislation. And I think we're kind of we're seeing we're seeing what a future would could look like on these social media platforms where they're not only the provider of the service, but they also have been put in the position of having to also be content moderators. And that's going to be a struggle for them. And I think it's going to degrade the services that people are getting. And it'll be an entryway for the government to kind of police speech more so on these platforms. Trying to eliminate violent threats online seems like a reasonable policy. And I'm not going to cry when a crying Nazi gets deplatformed. Um, but we should probably also remember that, you know, to some extent, Facebook and its success does rest on uh, state granted privileges. And so so while Nazis are obviously a threat to free speech and our, our freedom more broadly, you know, so are these corporate giants that have the ability to use that same power to eliminate our voices. So what do we do about these powerful media companies and is it time for a mass exodus or a, or a serious attempt at using an alternative that aligns closer to our values? Well, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I think there's definitely issues of like economies of scale there. And I think this is kind of something that maybe anarchists have run into kind of frequently is trying to create 
maybe in like open source alternatives to some of these like more conglomerate cloaked in intellectual privilege sort of gated community type things. I think, yeah, I think it would be great to see alternatives arise. This is, I also like, I kind of want to beef a little bit about this idea that like Facebook is a monopoly. I just, I don't really see that at all. I got permaban from Facebook and now I spend all my time on Twitter for better or worse like there was a, a there was like a politician complaining about Facebook's monopoly on Twitter, and it's like, I just I don't know I just I don't really I don't really buy that I'm very skeptical of Congress's ability to bust up the tech company. It's like I just don't really see that how that could happen. They did that supposedly with Microsoft in the '90s, and Microsoft is still around. I do think that people should delete their Facebook accounts, but I think maybe before that they should download their data. Um, don't. Don't find yourself in the position that I'm in where you get banned for being an advocate of gun rights and then you lose, you know, 12 years of your personal data to this company who apparently is making, who seems to be very comfortable with like the Trump administration. And that was like another aspect of the appeal for the Facebook was like when I appealed the ban, they were like, send us a copy of your ID, which I thought was kind of intense because it's like I was presumably banned for like p- political dissent and then they were like give us your ID so that's that's cause for consternation I definitely think that we should especially in terms of like organizing like Facebook events are definitely like it gets your event in front of eyes the Facebook algorithms the ad the ad algorithms are very robust and I think there's actually been in recent months you know ad boycotts on Facebook that probably have also contributed to Facebook's acting on some things. There was like Facebook stock price fell something like four percentage points or something due to an ad, an ad boycott on Facebook. And that caused like Mark Zuckerberg's net worth drop like tens of billions of dollars in the span of a few days. And then wouldn't, you know, like next week there's all these new policies about, you know, what types of content are allowed on Facebook. So, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the, my answer to your question is, yeah, that would be great to diversify and have alternatives, but I'm not, I'm not in a position, like, I don't have the technical know-how to, on how to achieve that, but I encourage people who do to try. I think we definitely need to be prepared for a potential future. We've seen it in other countries where just the internet is just completely turned off entirely. I think most recently that was like in Belarus. Um, so yeah, I think we should probably be prepared for these situations where this, the internet, a very decentralized institution has come to be dominated by very centralized institutions. And we're kind of at a fork that we can think of for the future of the internet. Will it continue to be dominated by these, you know, very concentrated corporate interests? Um, or will it, will it be kind of decentralized and maybe broken down a little bit? Hopefully the latter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, obviously possible to criticize the extent to which Facebook has taken advantage of state privilege without without advocating for the federal government to step in exactly and, and, and breaking it up. But um, I want to kind of move into something maybe a little more abstract when it comes to free speech, since we're sort of talking about that broadly. It seems to me that if we support free speech, we would have to acknowledge that some speech will always pose some type of risk of hurting people. Uh, leading individuals to embrace false ideas or any number of other harms. And also that any attempt to legally curb that seems harmful. With that being the case, how might someone who is a free speech absolutist deal with the problem of hate speech while avoiding paternalism or other cultural norms that are not so desirable? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say, I mean, I am very like... I'm very free speech absolutist. I would say I might have opinions that probably most like leftists probably would disagree with. There's this kind of popular quote by I think Karl Popper. It's something to the effect of like tolerance of intolerance is self-defeating. And this idea that, you know, these kind of liberal democracies will ultimately fail to authoritarianism because they're so wedded to the idea of tolerance that they'll they'll go on to tolerate intolerance, like tolerate Nazism and that sort of thing. I'm not particularly convinced by that argument. I think ultimately, if if I've learned anything, maybe in the last four years, it's that we need to talk more. And what I mean by that is like, especially like in the concept of like, I don't know, like Donald Trump's victory in 2016, I think was very much probably the results of a lack of communication, even just kind of like on the family level. 
on like a very local level of like people were, people are very, we're very, we're in a very partisan environment. People are very siloed in their respective camps. And that creates kind of obviously creates echo chambers. People are only kind of congregating around people that they agree with and hear and have similar opinions with. But it also the different side of that same coin is that we don't see other people's perspectives and it creates, I don't know, it's this like bifurcated thing. And like, I'm, I'm sure there's something to be said about social media's role in this, um, obviously. But I think, I guess what I would say is I'm very much kind of in agreement with kind of the John Stuart Mill take of like, we defeat, we defeat bad speech with good speech. Like it's through the collision with error that speech is corrected, that sort of thing. Um, that's kind of my perspective, but that said, I think the surge in like QAnon conspiracy theories, the pizza gate stuff in 2016, I think we need to have kind of a, maybe like an, I don't want to say like a national reckoning. That's kind of like overwrought, but like we should probably have some sort of understanding that disinformation and misinformation and even like like authoritarian talking points, authoritarianism is being transmitted to people. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, you know, on the, on a long enough timeline that speech will be, will lose. I think another aspect of this and which might be for better or worse, maybe a uniquely American idea, but this idea that like, I mean, we very much venerate the concept of like freedom of speech in this country. And I think free speech is really an umbrella term for a lot of different freedoms. And I think ultimately freedom of speech is also freedom of speech is exercised not only in like what we say and publish online and, and that sort of thing. It's also how we, it's who we associate with. It's freedom of association. It's, I don't know, it's kind of like the, the network we create and find ourselves in. And so I think one aspect of free speech and the way that we kind of, by being free speech absolutists, we kind of have to say like, yeah, it is kind of incumbent on the community, not really the state, but the community to like not allow others to succumb to like authoritarian impulses or to entertain those thoughts and those beliefs, but not going so far as to like, I don't think, I mean, I, it makes sense to me that like a publisher could refuse to publish Nazi propaganda, but I don't think that, that the state should obviously ban it. But then there's something to be said about, well, should, should we as anarchists organize and not let them? Um, and I, yeah, I think, I, I think that that's viable. I think that's a viable tool when, when you're staring down the face of authoritarianism. And yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of hilarious videos. I, was, I see threads on Twitter all the time of like, I saw one recently of these like two Nazis setting up their, their little Nazi book stand and just getting their shit tossed across the street and it was it brought me immense joy um and so yeah i I don't know i'm very like i like i come in on here and i talk about like self-defense and gun rights and how important it is but i'm also like i'm very like risk averse i'm very like i have i've carried concealed handguns in the past and i have concealed carry licenses in two states and i've and i've done that before and i've been in i've been in positions where i've been armed and i've detected conflict arising and I have exfilled, like gotten out of that situation. Cause I'm very like, I don't like violence <laughs> and I'm very, I'm very kind of leery of, of advocating violence. But that said, I'm not about to let, I'm not about to let like someone, I don't, I, I'm very conflicted if you can't tell. Um, mm. yeah, I don't know. I, uh, it's third party self-defense is possible. It's, it's, yeah. um, just as it's completely legitimate to defend yourself, so is it to defend someone else who's being attacked. I mean, and yeah, yeah it, it does like that does intertwine with Nazis organizing and stuff. I think it seems clear, you know, when they're organizing that. I mean, I don't know. I think that's a that's a clear threat. But yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to cry over a table getting turned over either. But, you know, another side of me, like, you know, at the time when Richard Spencer was touring doing speeches at different universities. I was I was cheering on, you know, everyone who was trying to disrupt that. Yeah. Um, but I'll never forget this moment when I was watching a YouTube video when he was on stage with a bunch of people who were interrupting them the entire time that he and his friend were speaking. And, and, and it was just silent. There was no more disruption. And someone, they actually let the person who wanted to ask a question ask it and didn't interrupt when uh, Richard Spencer was saying something. And he revealed himself to be a complete ass. You know, the emperor truly had no clothing. His answer was so embarrassingly 
short-sighted that he smiled and gave the mic to someone else because he didn't know what to say to it. And that was like the only time that everyone was silent. And so it kind of made me pause a little bit and was like, wait, <laughs> like this accidental moment where he was allowed to speak probably did more for anti-fascism <laughs> exactly. than our attempts to try to silence it. I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm probably wrong about that. <laughs> So, I mean, that's that'll transition like pretty cleanly into our discussion of firearms. You know, it's such a, a polarizing topic politically, yeah, right? guns are. How did you come to form your opinions about firearms and what inspired you to become vocal about them publicly? Yeah, so I, well, I never really touched a firearm until I got to college. And when I did get to college, one of my like mod mates my freshman year, um, was very into guns. He owned quite a few himself. And he brought me to our Second Amendment Club, the Ohio University Second Amendment Club. And they had very regular shoots. Like we would just go to the shooting range to this guy's property and everyone would contribute like 20 bucks and we would buy like a ton of ammo and just spend like an afternoon shooting, shooting targets, shooting clay pigeons. We would do textbook shoots, which was really fun. That was a really popular thing that we did um at the end of every semester instead of selling your books back to the bookstores for like 10 percent what you bought them for you could just bring them out and obliterate them with a shotgun or something and quite a people took us up on that and it was quite fun through my involvement with the second amendment club i obviously learned quite a bit about firearms and firearm laws and once you i don't know once you hold a gun and fire one and learn about them they're very much they very much are demystified and mm -hmm. it was, I mean, they're, they're, they're fun. Like, I don't, I don't know. That's kind of, that's how I got into it was I went to a gun range with a friend and I, I learned how to shoot and it was, it was very rewarding. When I turned 21, I bought my first two guns, which was really cool. And that, this was all, my introduction to guns was in Ohio and that was where I got my first concealed carry license and participated in, you know, the kind of like second amendment club activism um, but like, as I, as I grew up and matured personally and politically, my position on guns didn't really change, but my, my personal identity changed. I transitioned, I made gender transition and my belief in gun rights really only, it's only been more kind of affirmed. Like I went from, I went from kind of like identifying as like a, like a white straight man. And like, that's like, you know, life on easy mode. It's like the, it's like the default, right? And when I, you know, I had my gender transition and I very much moved through the world as like a woman now. And it's, it's really interesting because it's like that coincided with my move to like the East coast, which has considerably stricter gun control laws. And so now I've had to, like, I live in New York city, like the gun laws here are outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm unarmed here, which is pretty, which is a pretty big bummer, but it's, also, it's also where I felt the most, where I most need self-defense. Like, I don't really go out after dark here. The only people who have guns are really are the NYPD and criminals. And that's the nature, like that's the nature of gun control is, and this is kind of a cheesy NRA bumper sticker, but it's true when guns are outlawed, only outlaws have guns, but I would add like only outlaws and the government have guns. And so, yeah, like, I guess I would just say that my experience as like a member of the LGBTQ community has only really kind of solidified my belief in the right to self-defense and the right to bear arms. And I, yeah, I, art, I try to articulate that when I can. What a lot of people don't know is one of the, one of the more recent gun rights decisions out of the Supreme Court was Heller v. D.C. Um, and that was decided in 2008, I believe. And that Supreme Court decision conferred an individual right to a handgun. And a lot of people on the left are very critical. They are like, clearly the second amendment means you have to be in a militia and it's not an individual right. And the, the justices said that, no, the second amendment confers an individual right to bear arms, not a militia's right to bear arms. And the actual facts of that case, one of the plaintiffs in that case was a guy by the name of Tom Palmer, um, who at the time was a 20 something gay man who was with a partner or another gay man. And they were confronted by a, like a gang of, like homophobes who are, who are harassing them and threatening them with violence. And Tom Palmer brandished his handgun that he had on him in the, in the crowd scatter. And eventually, I don't know, like the finer details of like how it got to the Supreme court, but eventually, you know, he was, he became a plaintiff, one of like six plaintiffs in this case. 
And the, the Supreme Court, the, the lawsuit was challenging the District of Columbia's ban on handguns for, uh, for self-defense on, on your person and in your home. And the Supreme Court ultimately decided, like, if you actually read the opinion, I think it was Alito, um, they basically make the argument that minorities – gender minorities, racial minorities, sexual and gender minorities are actually, they're actually the class of people who most need their right to bear arms because they're the people who are most at risk of being the victims of like majoritarian violence or hate crimes and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like a, kind of exactly where I'm at. I very much advocate. I, I encourage my queer friends to arm up if they can. I've consulted my friends on what are good guns to buy, and I le- and I like doing that. Unfortunately, because I live in the city, I don't get to shoot nearly as much. I haven't been to the range in like a couple of years, which is kind of a bummer. But it would be, I don't know, I'm, I'm very much encouraging people to get involved in and to demystif- to do what I did, pick up a gun with someone you know who you who you trust and who you respect, and have them demystified. Because I think from another perspective, as like a trans person, like I think most trans people, most queer people would argue that media representation plays a really big role in our acceptance and how people view us and think about us. And I think that that's very much true, but I I would even go so far as to say that that's also true of how our society conceives of and thinks about guns. And the way that the media portrays guns is just completely flawed, whether that's movies, fictional TV shows, movies, that sort of thing, or, you know, journalists who have never encountered a gun in their life talking about it like they know what they're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm very much hoping to encourage more and more people who might not otherwise encounter firearms to go out and seek it. People on the left, the relative left of the political spectrum in the United States. Yeah, I'm trying to get more more armed gay and trans people. I love it. I love it. Good work. I support you and your efforts on that. Great. So going back to the article you wrote about your recent Facebook ban, in that article you point out that center-left figures profess concerns about marginalized people, yet they support gun control, and also how right-wing commentators claim to support firearm freedom but contradict themselves in practice by supporting anti-gun policies. Can you expand on what that means and why this is a seemingly predictable phenomenon? Yeah, so I guess I would say to start, well, just from like an overcriminalization standpoint, the United States already has the largest prison population in the world. I think the blockbuster number is that we are 5% of the world's population with 25% of the world's incarcerated population, which is just astounding. That means one in four people who are incarcerated are incarcerated in the United States, even though we only have 5% of the population. So first, I would say we need to not create new laws and make it easier for the police to brutalize people and to arrest them and send them to jail. And part of that means no longer criminalizing or not increasingly criminalizing people's access to guns. And uh, that's borne out in the fact that the vast majority of people who actually are charged with violating gun control laws are minorities. I don't know the exact numbers. I looked up an article, but that was like an eight-year-old article that said that something like 50% of people who are charged with gun crimes are black. Something like 40% are something like only like 25% of people who are charged are white. And it goes even further. I mean, it's just kind of borne out in the kind of the cliches of where gun control is enforced. It's enforced in cities, in urban areas. It's enforced against poorer people. It's not enforced against white people in Vermont or New Hampshire or Idaho. It's enforced against minority populations in inner cities. And a great example, a great salient recent example is the no-knock raid and murder of Breonna Taylor, where they basically said that the cops were completely justified because her boyfriend shot back at presumed home invaders who hadn't identified themselves. Um, And so, yeah, like we have a right to bear arms in this country. And that means that you shouldn't, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that means you shouldn't be murdered for bearing arms or for maybe bearing arms. I mean, that's that's always kind of what cops say to get to justify their executions of people is, I thought he had a gun or he was reaching for his waistband or yada, yada, yada. So yeah, I think, uh, I think people on the left need to be aware that we have so many laws in the books already and gun control laws are often used to 
um, there's like a term for it in the legal space where they're used as like, if you commit a crime without a gun, you would get a certain sentence. But if you commit a crime with a gun, your sentence is elevated. I believe that's borne out like a lot. Um, there's a lot of cases of people who are like first time offenders. They've never, they don't really have a record, but they're caught at a drug bust with a handgun. And so they, their first interaction with the criminal justice system results in decades in prison. Um, that's got to stop in my opinion. I, I think there was another half to that question. I think I just kind of answered why the left should have consternation on the right. Um, I would say, you know, conservatives, you know, the NRA and gun rights has long been kind of attributed as like a, a conservative or a Republican position. But historically, at least in the last, I would say historically in our country, really in all of our country's history, it's been conservatives and right of center people pushing gun control. Most recently, I would say that the contemporary gun control movement began in the 60s during the Republican government in California's reaction to the Black Panthers arming themselves. Uh, it was actually the prohibition on the open carrying of rifles uh, was pushed by Governor Ronald Reagan, a Republican, and it was backed by the NRA. And I think that was that was kind of the beginning of the contemporary gun control movement was that, that response to the Black Panthers. And even all the way up to today, we're seeing it. I mean, Donald Trump banned bump stocks after the Las Vegas shooting. Gun control is not a leftist position and gun rights is not a right position. It's very clearly like a bipartisan gun control is very much a bipartisan uh, position in Congress. Um, and it's been it's really just been a slow whittling of of gun rights. You have, you know, states are implementing magazine magazine capacity limits, um, passing laws targeting certain types of rifles, that sort of thing. But conservatives and Republicans can't really claim to be the party of gun rights because they've been they've actually been legislating gun control, at least in very high profile cases in the last few decades. Yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of my perspective, at least on the contemporary nature of the bipartisan nature of this stuff. Yeah, some approach this topic statistically. And in my opinion, it's difficult to form an opinion about firearms purely from statistics, right? Because there's just an ocean of contradictory information. Yeah. So obviously, you know, approach the next questions that I'm gonna ask you, however, you prefer. But yeah, a, a common argument against guns uh, claims that gun ownership leads to homicide and that if you get rid of guns, that you get rid of homicides, as we know them, at least. Uh, what are your thoughts on that argument? Um, yeah, so I think when we're talking about gun violence, we should try to take a step back and maybe put the numbers in a little bit of context. So I'm going to maybe dodge your question a little bit and feel free to ask me again. But what I want to say, I guess, in general, is that I did look at the numbers before we got on. And I think the numbers are about what I expected, which is to say that in the United States, in a given year, roughly 30 to 33,000 people are lose their lives to guns, right? 30 to 30, 33,000-ish, give or take, people are dead at the result of a gun. Um, and that's on an annual basis. Two-thirds of those deaths are actually suicides. So those are self-inflicted uh, gunshots. I mean, like when you use a gun to commit suicide, you're pretty successful. Um, and so, yeah, roughly 20,000 gun deaths a year can be attributed to suicides. So that means that the remaining third of gun deaths, roughly between, I would say between 10 and 13,000, 14,000, are murders, homicides with guns. Okay, so... I think it's just worth kind of stopping there and just kind of reckoning with that, that, you know, if we wanted to diminish gun violence in the country, we could knock out two thirds of it by focusing on the causes of suicide, which I think um, are independent of things that can be solved by gun control. Right. So this is things like poverty, um, homelessness, healthcare, access to food, education, that sort of thing. Those are really difficult societal questions that need grappling with. I think there's something to be said that like, if we banned guns, people would fail at their suicide attempts more, but that doesn't really strike me as kind of getting to the, to the meat of the problem there. And I guess the same thing could be said about banning guns with result to, to homicides. My understanding is that there's roughly, and I was surprised at how small the number is, but there's roughly 14,000 homicides a year, which just stri strikes me as such a small number, especially now that we're, we're, we're confronting, like, the coronavirus has killed 200, like, something like 220,000 Americans this year in just, like, eight months. Um, and in a given year, 
roughly 14,000 people or Americans are murdered. I'm co- fairly confident that that's a historical low um, and that violent crime is at a historical low with slight upticks this year, probably the result of the coronavirus and the economic calamity that resulted. But I guess to your point, I would say maybe they have a point where they say if we could ban guns, um, we would reduce homicides because it's, that seems pretty plausible given that you know, of the 14,000 homicides, roughly 10,000 are with guns. Um, so I would say that that's maybe they, maybe they're not or something, but then I would also say that there's another side to this, which is to say that there are, and I don't believe that this is really accurately tracked, which is unfortunate and it would be cool if it could be tracked. But my understanding is that there's way, 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 way more defensive gun uses in a year. That is to say that guns are used to Mm -hmm. preserve and defend life than are used to take life. The problem is, is like that stuff is very hard to track. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no like national database or repository for that information. And then additionally, countries that have implemented gun control on a widespread manner, particularly in Australia, after they implemented their gun control measures, they actually saw increases in violent crime. Mm-hmm. And the rationale here is that if you ban guns and it's like publicized, what was seen in Australia was an increase in home invasions. It was an increase in muggings an increase in sexual assaults. And I I think the logic here is that basically the criminal element in society realized that people no longer had the means to defend themselves. And so you saw, you might have seen a reduction in homicides. I'm not sure about that. But you also saw increases in other violent crimes, maybe not homicides, but, you know, muggings, home invasions, that sort of thing. Um, So yeah, there's, there's multiple, there's kind of multiple sides to it. I'm not I don't really think that the benefits of banning guns exceed the costs, in my opinion. That's kind of Mm -hmm. the whole point. And at the same time, like, I think I have a right to defend myself. And I I don't really like the idea of, I mean, this is the life that I live now. I live in New York City. I'm I'm basically coerced into the NYPD monopoly. If someone breaks into my apartment, the only recourse I have is the NYPD. And like, I don't know. I'm not particularly confident in their abilities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. That's my, that's, that's kind of how I handle the calculus. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It was a gun ban in Australia, right? For the most part. It was like a forced confiscation. So they said that these, these types of rifles are banned and you have to turn them in. Mm -hmm. Um, And they, they basically rationalize this. Like it's not confiscation because we're paying you for it. Uh Um, (laughs) But there's, there's actually, there's intense videos of like, these mach- these like are these like mecha arms that you see in like junkyards picking up like giant handfuls of AK-47s and like dumping them or not even like AK-47s like just like wood furnished rifles right like bolt action wood furnished rifles picking them up with this giant like mecha claw and then dropping it into this like metal wood shredder and just like shredding these guns yeah um and that was I don't know that video is like really heartbreaking yeah yeah hurts hurts and that was in the 90s right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and at the same time, since the 90s, I think um, the amount of guns in America has doubled since that time. And with the correlation of violent crime becoming significantly lower than it was in the 90s. Yeah, I think in the United States, there's um, in the United States, I don't believe like, I don't believe it, it's borne out in reality. It's not. I just know that there's 1.1 guns per Americans in the United States. So there's like, I don't know the exact numbers, but basically for every person in the United States, there's 1.1 guns um, and the number's only increasing. And yeah, we haven't seen, you know, it hasn't descended into the okay corral. It's it's pretty okay. And just to kind of dive down into, into the statistics a little bit more, um, I mentioned earlier that Heller v. D.C., the Supreme Court decision, which was settled in like 12 years ago in 2008, that conferred an individual right to own a handgun. Handguns are responsible for the lion's share of homicides, the vast majority of homicides with guns. The gun that seems to get the most hate in the media and which seems to be the target of the most legislation is the AR-15, mm-hmm. which is probably the most common rifle in the world right now because it's so it's so cheap and like easy to produce. Mm-hmm. It's simple. But the AR-15 is a rifle. And to that point, rifles are responsible for really no more than 400 murders a year. Right. Um, and so that number is just so vanishingly small. Like I'm like, I'm not certain, but I think like the number of people who are like killed by cows is greater than the number of people killed by rifles in the United States. And <laughs> like, like the number it's like, when you really put it into context, it's like, it's really, it's really something. <laughs> 
<laughs> Gotta watch out for them cows. I didn't know that. I didn't. Falling TVs are more of a threat to you than AR 15s. We need cow control. We need falling TV control. Yeah. Probably peanut allergy control and other types of control before we need AR 15 control. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, so you, uh, you, you said it earlier that obviously you, you have a, a lived experience of being more vulnerable without having a firearm because you said in New York it's they have very strict laws and as a trans woman, obviously you don't feel particularly safe at night. So I was wondering if you could expand on how gun control, uh, not only through your lived experience, but how gun control makes queer people specifically more vulnerable. Yeah, good question. Queer people specifically, I'm not super sure. I mean, the Hiller VDC facts are pretty clear. There's obviously like homophobia. There's obviously transphobia in the world. What I will say, and like I, I like will append a lot of what I say in this space, and when I talk with like queer people and other trans people about guns, like we're also you know dealing with mental illness and higher at higher rates. And like I said earlier, you know the majority of gun deaths are the result of suicides. So I am actually very like cognizant of the correlation between owning a gun and the statistics. Like they are there. Like if you have a gun in the house, you're more likely to to be hurt by it. That seems kind of obvious to me. I would for sure like to see more responsible gun ownership. I've seen some pretty shoddy responsible gun ownership in my my day. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question about like queer people specifically, apart from the fact that like there are intersections of identity, which I'm sure will make a, a bunch of people upset to hear me talking about intersectionalism. But, you know, I said earlier, like the majority of people who bear the brunt of laws are my majority individuals. I am white and I, you know, I try to acknowledge that. And, and I understand that my interactions with the criminal justice system are going to be a lot different than my queer, my queer trans friends who are, you know, of color. And I, yeah, I think that's something that should definitely, that's a conversation that, that, that people have to have kind of with themselves and with their, with their own communities. Um, I'm just very appalled that we've lived through like four years of this Trump administration and proud boys and tiki torches and Nazis organizing and, you know, the legitimacy of like fascist militia squads. And you still have well-meaning liberals talking about gun control when it's clear, like we should be taught, we really should be talking about like community self-defense and training people. This is something that I actually talked about with a friend recently. Like, even if they like banned guns in the United States, I still have the skills that I learned from my interaction with them. So it's like, that's, that's like a form of ca- like human capital that they can't take away from me. Um, and this, this ability, if you knew the, if you could just go to a range with a friend and learn how to load and unload an AR 15 or learn how to clean a gun or learn how to clear a slide and, and, you know, do drills with like squib loads or do like, you know, different types of drills with different types of guns. And you just kind of learn the mechanics and the basics I think that that sets you up for being prepared for the worst of situations that could befall us in the future. And yeah, I mean, like, there's all kinds of cautionary tales throughout history. I mean, um, the Nazis disarmed German Jews when they rose to power. In the research I was doing before this, I saw like a just like a, a linear timeline of racist gun control that was passed throughout the United States, specifically targeting slaves, recently freed slaves. Right after the Civil War ended and Reconstruction was beginning, many states passed what were called the Black Codes and just blanketly banned Black people from having firearms. I feel like I didn't answer your question, but I just I, I, I worry. I worry about the next couple of years and what what will happen to a population of people who have kind of eschewed guns as like conservative or Republican when it's actually like a pretty important life skill, I think. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Can you expand on the racist history of gun control? I mean, if you go back, like when slavery was abolished, the Constitution was amended. Basically, the state legislatures and the Congress basically moved to deprive recently freed slaves their access to the Second Amendment, essentially by saying that they're not citizens. And they basically said that the Second Amendment only applies to citizens, which to me seems very um, reminiscent of, of stuff today about, you know, not treating, not counting immigrants, undocumented immigrants in the census and that sort of thing, um, or saying only citizens have rights, like illegal immigrants don't have rights, which is nonsense. 
So yeah, before and after the Civil War, there was very much just like plainly racist, no, like, you know, black people can't have guns. I mean, if you just kind of chart it through history, like there's the Black Panthers, the Black Panthers were arming up and patrolling their streets in Oakland. And basically when the, when the LAPD would pull over black people, the Black Panthers would pull up behind them armed and basically give them legal counsel and say like, you don't have to answer that question. You don't have to answer that question. You don't have to answer that question. And like, basically provide like almost like pro bono legal armed legal service in the moment of the police encounter and the the like conservative intelligentsia and p- political class was horrified at this and so Ronald Reagan as governor and the NRA pushed California's ban on the open carry of firearms which brought us that really famous picture of the Black Panther standing on the steps of the California legislature I think the most recent one, we can chart it right up to pretty much modern day here in New York City. It's not often mentioned, but like stop and frisk was a a reviled policy here in New York City by the NYPD, pushed by Michael Bloomberg. And stop and frisk was ultimately a gun control policy. That's what they were doing. They were were stopping and frisking people for guns. Mm -hmm. And that was what it was. It was literally a gun control policy. Should people have the freedom to own any gun they want? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, through my friend in college, who was pretty well off, he had access to some pretty fancy and unique firearms that I got to enjoy. And there's all kinds of like expos around the country. Like there's Knob Creek in Kentucky, which is the Knob, I think it's the Knob Creek. I've been there. The Knob Creek machine gun shoot. I haven't been there, but I wanted to. Um, yeah, I'll just say, like, I, we've talked about it on the, on past episodes before. I was struck by the, not in the sea of MAGA hats, but people, like, openly walking around with, like, swastikas on their shirts and stuff. That sucks. I didn't know about that. That sucks. Yeah. So, yeah, but my understanding, like, my appeal to that is, like, they have, like, mini guns there. Um, you can, like, you can take a ride in a Huey and shoot a mini gun out of a Huey. Um, and I'm kind of all about that. Like, I, there's actually one of my, there's, like, a YouTube channel that I like where they have, like, a, they have like a World War II tank and they like they have it on this quarry and they like shoot a bunch of shit with it, which I think is cool and awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, my perspective is that, yeah, you should be able to have a tank. What I would draw the line at um, is I think that there's probably there's probably some munition or some firearm or some piece of artillery that probably is impossible to use without hurting or otherwise imposing a considerable externality on other people. And I'm thinking like the way that this conversation usually goes is like, oh, if you can have a tank, then you can have tactical nukes, right? My opinion on nukes is that nukes are impossible to be used like recreationally. Um, Recreational nukes strikes me as probably like an oxymoron given like what we know about them. But like, I think it's totally plausible that someone could like have a tank on their property and shoot stuff with it and not hurt anyone else. And not, I don't think that there's really a compelling interest to deny someone that. Uh, but I do think there's probably a compelling interest to ban- to like not allow someone to have a nuclear device. And I, I'm probably of the opinion that nukes probably shouldn't exist. So advocates of quote unquote reasonable gun control claim to have less ambitious goals and usually promote simply making it more difficult to legally obtain a firearm. Some who support having easy access to firearms understand these, you know, quote unquote reasonable laws as a potential slippery slope to serfdom. What are your thoughts on this crowd and their moderate attempts to curb gun violence? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty kind of across the board opposed to restrictions to buying guns. I'm categorically opposed to like magazine capacity limits. And it's like also on just like a practical level, like magazines, people say like clips. It's not a clip. Most times it's not a clip, it's a magazine. And a magazine, (laughs) ultimately, at the end of the day, a magazine is a box with a spring in it. Mm -hmm. And like 3D printers have already shown how easy it is to just 3D print 30 round magazines. Yep. Um, And so I think that that's kind of a futile effort to ban like high capacity magazines. High capacity is a matter of opinion. I saw like there was like one attempt in California to create like a one round magazine limit so that it was like essentially like turning like a semi-automatic rifle into like a bolt action, but still having it be like mag fed, which is really bizarre. I'm also opposed to things like, I don't know, like waiting days, like having to wait, not being able to buy a certain amount of guns in a certain period of time. I'm opposed to that. From my look at the data, I think maybe the one thing that I could see that could be seen as a actual indicator of potential future gun violence is 
if someone has a history of like domestic violence and there's something to be said about maybe curbing someone who has a history of spousal abuse, having them having access to firearms, easy access to firearms. But that's me being, I don't know. I'm, I'm very hesitant to, to embrace really any new law. Penny, like if I'm getting what I want, I would like to see machine guns legalized. Like I think we should be able to have fully automatic firearms, pretty bummed about that being illegal. I forget when that was passed. That was like an 86 or something or like the seventies, the national firearms act that banned fully automatic weapons for civilians. And that's like another aspect of this that I think is also underappreciated by like most people in the public is that like, you'll have like commentators on like MSNBC talk about like semi fully automatic, which is just nonsensical. People think that you can go to the gun store and get an AR-15 and then it's like spray and pray you're like the Terminator and you can just like spray and murder all these people. But it's like, that's not the technology that's available to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yeah, I mean, even furthermore, like the police have all that, all of that gear already. And we've, they've already shown themselves at how unaccountable they are. So yeah, I don't know. A lot of the arguments for gun control just don't really have an effect on me really. Right. People often make the ableist claim, and you kind of touched on this earlier, that people with mental illness are more likely to be perpetrators of gun violence. Or you see some, you see something, a mass shooting, and the immediate thing that people say, oh, that person was crazy, right? But a lot of research shows uh, and highlights that, that folks with mental illness are actually a lot less likely to be perpetrators of gun violence. And in fact, the opposite is true, that they're more likely to be victims is this true? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. So my understanding is that people with diagnosed mental illness are more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. Um, and I'll say that I think honestly, the it's not so much mental illness that seems to be the common denominator in a lot of these like mass shooting events. It really seems to be racism, white supremacy, and racism. That was the case in like South Carolina. In Norway, the Anders Breivik in Norway was like a was like a neo Nazi in a country with very robust gun control. I'll add. And what I guess I would say is that additionally, beyond racism and just kind of like neo Nazism, there's a major correlation with like incels, this like new crowd of like radicalized men's rights activists who think that like they're owed sex and they're they're frustrated that they can't have it and they take it out by engaging in you know mass violence um i don't think i don't think that being an insult is a mental illness i think it's a lot of maladjusted men yeah i think maybe it's probably more an indictment of maybe our media environment um and i don't i don't want to say like parenting um but I, i'm very hesitant i'm very 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 hesitant and reluctant to blame the tool that's used um you're seeing I don't know. It's not, it's not hard to, for people. If people want to engage in violence, they're going to engage in violence. Banning a cosmetic feature or a tool used in that doesn't really strike me as particularly productive. We should be maybe trying to focus on underarching kind of motivations or the more structural roots of the issue, in my opinion. But I will also admit that it's probably easier said than done. But yeah, I really don't appreciate the scapegoating of people with mental illness I own three firearms personally, and I've also been diagnosed with depression. I've been diagnosed with anxiety. I don't think that that disqualifies me from owning a firearm. Um, and then additionally, like the, the concept of mental illness is a very fluid thing. Like, I mean, a couple hundred years ago, like a masturbating woman could be described as a mentally ill. Like women were admitted to mental institutions for mm-hmm. being gay, for leaving their husbands and all the all sorts of things. So yeah, I don't like the scapegoating of people with mental illness. And yeah, it it should be mentioned more often than it is that people with mental illness are more likely to be victims of crimes than perpetrators of crimes. And we should, and they're also more likely to be victimized by the criminal justice system. Um, and that's something that we need to keep in mind if we're, if we're advocating for more laws, we're essentially advocating for more police and more courts and more jails. And those systems kind of invariably gobble up the marginalized in our society. And that includes people with mental illness, people who are poor, people without access to homes and that sort of thing. So how do we expand access to guns, especially for marginalized people? Yeah, I like this question. Um, So I guess what I would say, and this is maybe going to be a little educational for some people, but, and I could be wrong because it's been, it's been a few years since I was really kind of knee deep in this stuff. But my understanding is that basically the NRA 
has a monopoly, sort of a de facto monopoly on the issuance of handgun, basically handgun certification, handgun certificates is the word I'm looking for. And what I mean by that is in most states where they have some sort of concealed carry framework, they have some sort of qualification mechanism where like you need to be a qual you need to be qualified to carry the handgun. And that is basically proven when you go to the sheriff's office to apply for your concealed carry permit, you basically have to provide proof of competency, which is provided by basically the NRA, which is almost a monopolist in this in this realm. What my answer to your question and what I've kind of has kind of been like a pilot project of mine, which I've not moved on in years because I've just I have ADHD and can't focus on anything to save my life, is this idea that we need to get more we need to get more people certified as basically NRA NRA basic pistol instructors. And I want more, you know, I want more queer people to do that so that we can have like we could essentially like more or less rubber stamp competency. Um, we could, we could have like queer handgun courses and have safe spaces for trans people to learn how to use firearms and get their certificates so they can get their carry licenses. That's in my opinion, that's something that I think is kind of low hanging fruit. And I think it should just be talked about more often that it's weird that essentially the NRA, the NRA, which has kind of proven itself to be almost like a money laundering scheme for rich Republicans but they've kind, you know, they supported the bump stock ban that Trump signed into law a couple of years ago. They're very much like, you, I mean, you said it. Knob Creek is full of like Nazis, like essentially a white supremacist organization is the bottleneck that initiates carry licenses. And so I would very much like to see that bottleneck eroded and removed. And yeah, just beyond that, I think we need to ha- kind of have more conversations. Conversations like what you and I are having right now. I very much have tried in my circle to demystify guns, especially among like queer people. It's hard. Um, and I respect people who, who, you know, don't want to entertain it through their own fears or whatever, their own biases. That's, I'm not trying to force anything on anyone. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my perspective in terms of how do we kind of proliferate gun ownership among the marginalized. Um, and you, you've seen this kind of with like the Black Panther Party and like the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. They're they're doing it on their end, trying to get more. I mean, gun ownership has increased most among Black people and amongst women in recent years. And I think that that's that's kind of a sign of how things are kind of shifting. And I would like to see, yeah, I would like to see more queer and trans representation. Obviously, there's like Pink Pistols are out there. It's like a an LGBTQ rights gun group. They're relatively unknown. There's Redneck Revolt. John Brown gun clubs out there. Those are distinctly kind of more characterized as like a working class group. But yeah, I'm definitely interested in trying to get more queer and trans people armed. Awesome. Awesome. So towards the end of these conversations, I'd like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or idea and I ask my guests to respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? I'll give it the call. Let's try. All right. Ronald Reagan. Boo. Um, it's really funny though. Like I think about, I kind of explained at the beginning of this about my intellectual journey. Um, and yeah, around maybe around 10 years ago, exactly. I can, I can envision a picture of me in my sophomore dorm room where I was wearing a, a Reagan Bush 84 t-shirt that my uncle got me. Um, and so that should kind of show you kind of how far I've come, um, where maybe like, yeah, like 10 years ago, I was kind of like sympathetic to like the tea party movement and I identified as a Republican, but yeah, I mean, over time, I very much like I've learned more. Um, we spoke quite a bit about Reagan kind of breathing life into the gun control movement. Um, but yeah, yeah, not a fan. Grimes. Oh, Grimes the artist. I mean, come on. Um, my, I mean, my cat after her. Um, I'm, yeah, I've, I've been obsessed with Grimes the artist for a few years now. Um, I think she's like a musical prodigy. I've described her, and this might be selling her a little short, but I've described her as like my generation's Bjork. I don't know. I just, yeah, I love her to death. I need my cat after her, so that should speak volumes. I'm a little weirded out by like the Elon Musk stuff, but I think it's pretty clear that he's dating down in that situation. Yeah. Um, John Brown. Oh, John Brown. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of John Brown. I wish I knew more. When I think about John Brown, I remember, um, when I lived in DC within DC is actually Frederick Douglass's house that he lived in, um, later in life. 
And I went on two tours there because it's so cool in the five years that I lived there. And before you go on the tour, they take you into this little theater and they, they show you this like really cheesy acted kind of dramatization of Frederick Douglass's life. And they have a little interaction with John Brown before he goes to raid Harper's Ferry. And yeah, I I mean, I'm not like super well read on him and, and the events that surround him. I, but I am, I'm obviously in favor of people who were invested enough in taking up arms against the institution of slavery. Um, and I wish more people knew about him. And I think there's probably parallels for how people, how he was treated and was eventually proven correct in the years that followed and how some people are being treated today in the vilification of anti-fascists and kind of people who have been warning of the, the path we're on in our country. Emma Goldman. Um, I, I picked up her memoir a couple of years ago through the recommendations of a friend. And it is, it's incredible. Um, it's an autobiography. So it's her own words about her own life. Um, and Emma Goldman, I mean, I don't know what else I, they need to make like a biopic about her. Cause she was like, she's like the Forrest Gump of anarchists. Like this memoir is crazy. She, she sat in on a lecture by Freud. She was pen pals with Oscar Wilde. She met Helen Keller at one point. She was basically enlisted into the, by Lenin into this like Soviet archival project to basically go around revolutionary Russia and like archive the, like the czarist stuff, like, like went across Russia and to all these like cathedrals and castles and helped archive like the, the pre-revolution Russian era. Volturin Declare. I very much like Volturin Declare, especially her advocacy of anarchism without adjectives, because, I mean, little has changed. There's so much infighting in the anarchist movement, and it's really, it's kind of encouraging to, like, read Volturin Declare and Emma Goldman and realize that they were having the same arguments 100 years ago. And I don't know, it's like, it's kind of encouraging, like, but it's also like, wow, we really haven't moved anywhere. We're having the same <laughs> Awesome. So that's the lightning round. So we have, uh, today we have one listener question for you. And this is asked almost every single time I interview someone. And it is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? That's a really good question. Uh, The individual to me would say, like, you could probably pretty easily make it yourself. I like the idea of trade. I like the idea of commerce. I've been really turned off lately in my conversations with some of my anarchist peers who are of the more communist persuasion that they're very much like they're very much hostile to just that idea of commerce or the idea of just having a trade or having a skill or or laboring at all and i don't know i kind of i like the idea i i very like i you mentioned that i studied economics like i'm very much enamored by like the concepts of specialization and comparative advantage and and gains from trade and these sort of kind of core economic principles. And so, yeah, I think in my ideal world, there's probably people out there who have passions in coffee and cappuccinos, and I'm sure you could find someone who would be more than willing to make you one. I would very much like to see coffee industry not dominated by large conglomerate monopolists and corporations. Where I live in Brooklyn, I actually live like walking distance from a neat little cafe, so I don't have to go patronize Starbucks whenever I want coffee, which is really nice. Okay, so moving towards the actual end of our conversation here, where should folks go to learn more about the topics that we've discussed today? I would encourage people to come to c4ss.org. Um, that's where a lot of my writing has been published lately. I was actually, I wanted to plug another piece by a friend of mine, Kelly V, another Kelly at C4SS. She wrote an article, Arm the Mentally Ill. I don't know, that's a really good piece. It's very brief. But a lot of what I've talked about can probably be found here at C4SS. I tweet pretty frequently on Twitter. So my handle on Twitter is Anarcha Kelly, um, and that's kind of my handle everywhere. So you can probably find me on like Instagram and LinkedIn if you wanted. Um, I don't know why you would. Could you imagine the anarchist LinkedIn scene? That sounds cheesy. I feel like it's such a niche topic. There's really not that many people writing on it. I would encourage people to check out like Redneck Revolt. Check out John Brown Gun Club if there's any in your area. Pink Pistols, check them out if they're in your area. Yeah, I don't know. I'm like, I'm in a really weird situation where I'm like rebelling against my like normie libertarian past. And I'm like also really turned off by like the authoritarian tendencies of a lot of like the online left. Um, and so I really, I don't know, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of starved for this sort of content too. So maybe, maybe your listeners will have, will have resources for me and that'd be really cool. 
Do you have any last thoughts to uh, leave the listeners with or any advice that you'd like to, to give them in regards to um, anything that we've touched on today? I don't know. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on your show. Yeah, it's interesting that people think I'm important enough to talk to me for two hours. I have a nice ego massage, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I uh, I encourage your your listeners to check me out on social media. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not that great, but you might like the pictures of my cats, my cat that I post. Wow, Kelly. So that was awesome. Thank you. That I, I, I mean it. That was really great. I, I, I really enjoyed that. I have been wanting to have a conversation more focused on firearms and, and related topics for a long time. And yeah, I can't think of a better person um, than someone like you to have that with. And I thought you've brought a lot to the table. And I think uh, listeners are, are going to really enjoy everything that you've had to say. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my interview with Kelly Wright. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. And be sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us keep this project going. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.